Thank you. Thank you, Audrey and Sam. I also would like to offer my thanks to the members of the Inauguration Committee, uh, especially Janet Benton, Karen Fagan, and Jackie Slyker, uh, to Sam Glick and our Board of Trustees, especially those emeriti whose decades of service to the college are a great gift, my gratitude indeed. Our faculty and students, alumni, our city, the nations who come here today, thank you. Thank you for the poetry for the music, for the joy and intellectual rigor of the panels, for the exuberance and wisdom you've shared so freely to my family and especially my children, Georgiana and Elijah, some of my oldest and dearest friends, many of whom have assembled from thousands of miles away. You make my heart glad. And to my many new friends here today, I'm so happy to be here with you. So, it's not over yet. Today, I formally assume an office whose holders over 130 years, but one of the finest undergraduate institutions in the world. It is a day of beginnings, yes. <laughs> it's a day of beginnings, yet it is also Founders Day, a day we look back. Our founders and leaders behind them strove for excellence, yet they knew as human beings they could never find perfection. Their sights were set high, their values powerful and real. Yet even as abolitionist zeal had propelled some of them to the Civil War, missionary zeal led others to found residential schools for Native students, youths who found those places devastating. I've heard the descendants of Native students educated at such places speak of how their forebears were forced to hide language, culture, and ceremony as the price of attendance. This knowledge is sobering, it's painful, but we cannot responsibly or morally look in pride at what we have become, even with what is pride at what has been achieved, without also acknowledging what costs and tribulations have been exacted. So we as a community hold in our hands and in our hearts the words and deeds of many whom we do not know, yet neither knowledge nor lack gives absolution. What we must yield is respect and walk a humble path, recalling we are on the paths we walk because others have stepped before us and let us choose our own steps widely, wisely as we seek our Pomona together. As I speak of our Pomona, I too am walking a path that started long ago. And I'm going to tell a bit of an origin story. Uh, they bring paradoxes about who we are and who we'll be because people, colleges, and generations change. And I'm defined in part by my story, but more than that, I'm determined by it. In Boston in 1850, my third great-grandfather, Henry Whedon, was a freedman tailor and president of the New England Freedom Association. His efforts to integrate Boston's public schools are recorded in the abolitionist publication, The Liberator. Now, 1850 was a fateful year. The Fugitive Slave Act forced local magistrates and police to seize and hold persons claimed as property by any slaver until a deputized federal marshal could return that person to bondage. These were momentous and perilous times, especially for a black man with tenuous footing in this nation. The fear of being repatriated, sent back, returned to some purported home was real then. It is real in a different yet powerful way now. That December, a federal deputy came to Henry Whedon's shop. He was looking for someone to work for him. Instead, he got a letter. The cloth is gone, the letter is not. At the time, literacy registered power. It was a statement that black people were human when there was general agreement that we were not. Words showed that we could reason, record the rational and the passionate, and thus they came to full humanity. So in words preserved in the Gilder Lehrman collection in New York City, Henry Whedon wrote, December 4th, 1850, Mr. Watson Friedman. Sir, your coat came to me this morning for repairs. I take this method for returning it without complying with your request. With me, principal first, money afterwards. Though a poor man, I crave the patronage of no being that would volunteer his services to arrest a fugitive slave or that would hang 100 ends for 25 cents each. Henry Whedon, 19 Franklin Avenue. He wrote and thereby claimed a legacy for which men and women had died. With pen strokes, he proclaimed loud and clear his own humanity and that of those still in bondage. He claimed a birthright not only of freedom but of voice, a value we at Pomona share. 
We make our words count. We do not go quietly. That resistant spirit shapes me. He shaped his children and hand after hand in generations. It came to my mother and me, to my brothers, George, Reggie and Harry, and my cousins, Robbie and Paul. I share it here with you. My father, Davis, was born in Georgia in the 20s when former slaves and Confederate veterans were about the same age as Korean War veterans are now. His family controlled land, but we washed and cooked and worked as laborers. We were also teachers, where violence and forced labor for trivial or supposed offenses were part of daily reality. My aunt nearly lost her job after protesting when a white landowner stormed her class and pressed children to harvest his crops. Such was dad's time. Yet when he was called, he served with pride in World War II. He moved north, found employment in my mother Barbara, was an accomplished educator, a leader of her teacher's union, a really hard negotiator, and a wonderful mom. I'm grateful that even as my parents endured threats of firebombs at home, as they integrated neighborhoods and schools, they never gave up, and I'm here. And it brings me to a place where we all seek to stand strong, to be in support of all of our rights, to be an engine of transformation through education. I'm a mom and a wife. I've got a caring, talented husband, John, a man whose history, like mine, is filled with actors who resisted oppression and found their voices. And I'm grateful he and my parents and Law, Mildred, and Reuben are here today. Who'd have known? Thank you. We're here. Who'd have known it? I climbed the stairs to my office, losing past the oil portraits of presidents past, men with whom I share office and responsibility, but who came from places very different from my own. But again and again, Pomona presidents have fought hard for what is right. James Blaisdell opening gates to women and people of color when others would not. E. Wilson Lyons helping to keep students of Japanese ancestry free from internment during World War II. David Oxt be fighting for DACA and undocumented students. I am proud to be walking the paths that they have walked. I guess I'm a first. Inspiring as the summations of being first woman president or first African American president are for many, they're for others merely summations, shorthand descriptions that box, wrap, and comfortably inventory my presence in such a way as to unfold difference but I'm not here as a carefully presented package. <laughs> I am here seeking to impact the future with every one of you. Each of you, my colleagues in color of less colorful vestment, our honored speakers, our students, staff, friends, neighbors, alumni, parents, all of us, are standard bearers of who we are and can become. None of us came on our own steam alone and we're obligated beyond ourselves. Such obligations may seem a heavy burden sometimes, but not if we work together. We're called from so many places, called to form one place. What community do we seek? Let me be clear, I'm not issuing a call to conform, to heave to and submit to whatever forces may be. I'm calling for shared responsibility. I'm calling us for us both to listen and to speak. This, I believe, is part of our calling as Pomona College as we look to the future. The future. I don't have a crystal ball. I prefer Minerva McGonagall to Sybil Trelawney. <laughs> I have a soft spot for Pomona Sprout. Yet the future isn't only about imagining or seeing, it's about prioritizing and doing. Now, I can't tell you everything I want for our Pomona today. Many more days will bring many more lessons, more views from each of you, but I want to share just three. Now, by the way, three is a magic number. 47 is two. <laughs> I hereby open the scavenger hunt on this speech. First sage hen to find the hidden treasure gets a lunch at the sage hen cafe on me. <laughs> now, I said I wanted to prioritize three things. First, We've already put a stake in the ground for access, but where do we stand on equity and inclusion? We must make this a place where everyone has the tools to thrive. We at Pona, Pomona insist that opportunity and success must be undetermined by who we are. Yet, we're defined by who we are too. There's a difference between those two base terms, defined and determined. 
So we say success must not be determined by where any of us came. Regardless of where we originate, coming here must mean we can achieve what is truly great. We're still shaped by who we are. Our identities matter. We own them by our taking language to speak who we are and ask for what we need. Our histories matter. We own that past and our present by critical engagement with the world around us. And when we join together to shape our Pomona, then our hands and minds meet with determination. We go from that to a newly imagined landscape where determination leads to engagement. We reach our hands to each other to refine, to rethink, to imagine, and to create. But let us think, secondly, about why we are here. We embody the liberal arts in every corner of this beloved place. In the old paradigm of learning, the very old one, the medieval one, Translatio, translatio studii. Knowledge is transferred linearly from one generation to the next. But we do something other than that, something special. Pomona is a place where knowledge crosses disciplines, boundaries, borders to become translational. We continually translate knowledge across people, places, and paradigms and disciplines to change the world. We discover, we create, and every discovery begins with a question, an observation, something that piques the imagination. As a community, we test our knowledge, engage deeply with our fields, our peers, and the world beyond us. We don't close our eyes to critique, to alternate possibilities, to the reality we may be wrong. And the ultimate result is something new in the world, a new idea, a new solution, a new molecule, a new policy, a new work of art, a stronger community. So, Third, let us consider how we want to engage in the world together as a community, how we want to speak, how we want to be heard on the immense stage that is ours. We have a voice, indeed many voices. What will we say and how will we say it to the world? When this college was launched, the world meant something different. Our place now is different. We must decide together what that place will be. We've stood for access. We must stand for equity and inclusion. We've stood for principle. We must stand for nuance. We are smarter than slogans, smarter than simple binaries, smarter than the world always knows. We can be humble. We can open our voices to the world. We can shape discourse now. Listen to each other. Hear each other. And please mark these words. As one Pomona, we will realize the future of our own making. Thank you. Let's celebrate each other. Let's party. And then let's get to work.